So far, we have used t-test to illustrate how to evaluate a population mean from a sample mean using null hypothesis significance testing. In fact, t-test is almost exclusively used to test two groups with small sample sizes if they are statistically different in their means or not. Even though um, the t-distribution was known much earlier, it is often credited to William Gossett's 1908 paper under the pen name student. So he was a house statistician at the Guinness Brewery and was interested in finding an economical way to monitor the quality of stout, which is the main ingredient of Guinness beer. Then he devised this T test for the purpose to test the quality of the barley with a sample size as small as three. The reason why he needed to use the pen name is not clear, but one thing that is clear is that it was the company that did not want him to use real name for whatever the reason. So in his publication, Gosset called the, uh, the T distribution as the frequency distribution of standard deviations of samples drawn from a normal distribution uh, or no, uh, a normal population, which implies important properties of the T distribution. So as I said, um, T statistics is used to compare two sample means, whether they are statistically different or not. So when two sample means are compared using the t-test, they are tested against the nil difference between the two hypothetical population means from which the sample means are drawn, where the null and alternative hypothesis are the following. So the null here, so you're comparing two hypothetical population means, mu1 and mu2, and the difference is assumed to be zero in the null, or you assume that the, those two means are the same. And on the other hand, the alternative hypothesis is that, no, the difference between the two population mean is not zero in terms of, you know, statistically speaking, or they are just statistically different in two-tailed way, right? But if you predict that um, the sample mean y, the population mean 1 is greater than population mean 2, then the difference obviously become positive, right? And then this is one version of one tail test, but if you predict that uh, mu1 is less than mu2, then the difference will be negative or this way, and this is another uh, directional hypothesis you can test. Um, so t-test involves two variables. So one nominal variable, which is called a grouping variable, that only has two values because we are comparing two groups with the t-test, right? So for example, if you compare male versus female, or you want to compare treated group versus control group, or whatever group one versus group two. So um, it involves you know, one nominal variable, the t-test, with uh, two uh, levels of group, or two different groups, basically. And these groups are compared based on a one single outcome measure, uh, which should be at least interval or ratio level of measurement, right? because you need to be able to calculate the mean and standard deviation and so on. So um, this uh, outcome variable is shared between the groups uh, that are being compared, right? So you, you're measuring the same outcome measure um, between these two groups. So t-test looks at the overall difference, um, which is the average difference in the outcome variable between the groups. So um, this is general equation um, of the t-test, basically. So um, in the numerator, we are comparing the observed difference between the two sample means against the expected difference between the population means, which is oh, 
zero. That is basically zero. So we're comparing if the sample mean difference is statistically different from the expected zero difference. So that is the null, right? We do not um, assume that there will be difference in the null, right? When nothing happens. So when um, no change is um, expected, right? And then this difference divided by the estimate of the standard error of the difference between the two groups, right? X1 bar and X2 bar. So that is a sample mean difference. And this is standard error of uh, the sample mean difference. So um, this is just a replaced with the symbols, right? So the observed difference between the two sample mean is just a X1 bar minus X1, X2 bar. And then the expected difference between the two population mean is represented by the Greek letters, mu1 and mu2, and then that difference. And this term is just disappears because this is just a zero, right? So all you're left with in the numerator is just a sample mean difference. And then this difference is divided by the standard error of the difference. Um, so that is the general equation of the t-test. Depending upon whether the individual subjects, patients, samples in each group are related or not, there are two different modes of comparing any two treatments, conditions, or groups on an outcome variable. So let's take a, a hypothetical example study where you want to test the efficacy of a new drug to reduce blood pressure in hypertensive patients. So one way to design an experiment is to recruit a group of hypertensive patients, say 100, then split them into two groups um, by random assignment and compare their blood pressures after treating only one group with the drug. Here the expectation is that the overall blood pressure is reduced only in the treated group right, compared to the control group where no treatment was given. So this is known as a between-subject design, and the mode of comparison is called the between-subject comparison because the same outcome measures, which in this case blood pressure, um, are compared between the two supposedly independent groups. So accordingly, this type of comparison or experimental design is also known as an independent, unpaired, or unrelated groups or samples design. Individual participant or sample is randomly assigned to only one of two conditions or groups, and each individual is tested only once in the assigned condition. When the outcome variable is measured using between subject uh, design on um, independent samples t-test is used to test the difference between the groups or conditions in Jamovi. Okay, so here is the equation for the independent samples t-test, which looks quite uh, complicated, but, um, you know, um, you don't have to know uh, this equation to calculate the t-statistics for the independent samples t-test because we have Jamovi. But what I want you to get away with from this slide is this uh, degrees of freedom. Okay, so here the n1 represents the, the number of samples in the first group and n2 is the number of samples in the second group. And then, so basically, if you add these together, N1 plus N2, that is the total number of subjects involved in a study. And then you need to take away two from this total number of subjects. And that's because there are two means involved, right? Mean from the group one and mean from the group two. So because there's our, there are two sample means involved in this independent samples t-test, you need to take away two um, to calculate the degrees of freedom uh, because these sample means are fixed for 
uh, the sample. Now let's consider the same example of testing a new drug to reduce the blood pressure again. This time we will use a different design called the within subject design to test the same hypothesis. In this design, you will recruit the same number of hypertensive patients, say 100, and measure their baseline blood pressure. Instead of splitting them into two groups like before, you will give all of them the drug and measure their blood pressure again after they are treated for a certain amount of time and compare this treated blood pressure with the blood pressure at the baseline. Here the expectation is the same as before. The treated blood pressure will be lower than the baseline blood pressure if the drug is indeed effective. Otherwise, the drug is not effective. But what's different here is the way the blood pressure measurements are compared. Now the blood pressures measured before and after the treatment are related or paired because they are measured twice on the same individuals. Therefore, the comparison of the outcome measure uh, which is blood pressure is made essentially within each and same subject which is also known as dependent paired repeated or related samples design so in this design um, the outcome variable is measured repeatedly within the same subject for example um, so the typical example of such design is the before and after effect of a drug on the same subject or, um, you know, as long as the groups or conditions that are compared uh, are related somehow or paired, matched, uh, ma matched on a you know, common ground, then um, the subjects in each group don't have to be the same individual. So, for example, if uh, you are comparing pairs of twins on the effect of the drug, then it is reasonable to think that the pair uh, pairs are related to each other, and we can treat them as within subject rather than the between subject. So, with this type of comparison, each individual is said to act as its own control. So, um, the subject-to-subject -subject variability between the groups or conditions uh, can be minimized compared to the between-subject design. Um, in addition, this design is more effective in terms of number of subjects required and power to detect a difference than the between-subject design um, given uh, the same hypothesis. However, when the effect of the first experimental manipulation, for example, the effect of drug, is permanent or irreversible on the outcome variable, then they cannot be tested again on the second manipulation, for example, another drug, the effect of another drug. So in Jamovi, a pair samples t-test is used to test the difference between the groups when within subject design is used. And this is the general equation for pair samples t-test. Um, the, the, the equation is a, looks much more simpler than the um, independent samples t-test, but this is essentially um, the t-test for one sample t-test too. So here the x subscript d bar is the average difference between the two groups or conditions. So this is the mean of the difference between the conditions. So in <clears throat> calculating the pair sample T statistics, you first need to calculate the difference between the conditions and then take the mean of the difference. So that's what it is. And the mu subscript D, that is the expected uh, difference, the population difference, right? But this is again zero. Right, so this term is just, you can just ignore this term. 
and the standard deviation of the difference is SD and this is divided by the number of pairs right here the n is the number of pairs okay um, uh, it is that the n is representing and in the pair sample t-test um, the number of measurements between the group cannot be different right because they are paired so if you have a you know, different number of uh, measurements or subjects in either of the condition then you know it is not really pair samples in a sense okay and the degrees of freedom for pair samples t-test is n minus one so n again is the number of pairs in the experiment and minus one because we only have a single mean right mean of the difference in calculating the t statistics that's why we only take away one um, because there's only single mean involved in calculating the t statistics now we think we can run the respective t-test as long as we know which one to use either pair samples t-test or independent samples t-test depending upon the relationship between the groups being compared however it is not as straightforward as we wish them to be um, the t-test we have talked about so far is one of the uh, parametric tests um, the parametric test makes certain assumptions about the parameters of the population distribution from which the sample is drawn so this is often the assumption assumption that the population data are normally distributed and which is known as normality assumption and when the assumptions are met then we can run the respective parametric t-test however if any of the assumptions are violated and we run the test uh, by just ignoring um, the, the violation then the resulting stats um, and the uh, the respective p-values will be inaccurate uh, which will lead to the wrong conclusion on the other hand uh, non-parametric uh, tests are dis distribution assumption free and as such can be used for non-normal data so in case uh, the normality assumption is violated then uh, we can um, switch to the respective non-parametric test to achieve only the significant testing so um, here are the assumptions you need to check before you can run the independent samples t-test so the, uh, the first assumption is that your data uh, for both groups that you are trying to compare uh, should be measured at least at the interval level right because you need to you need to be able to calculate the mean and this is actually the same for the um, the dependent samples the pair samples but uh, for independent samples we have uh, two other assumptions you need to check the first uh, is the normality assumption so the both data sets uh, should be normally distributed as um, you can see from this picture so just let's just assume that any symmetrical um, distribution is normally distributed so here the distributions are normally distributed um, that's what um, um, is um, presented here so um, the x1 bar is the sample mean of x1 and x2 bar is the sample mean of the second group so both of the data um, should be normally distributed and the second assumption is what's called equal variance assumption so both sets of data should be similar in terms of variances or the spread right so the spread is represented by uh, the width of each um, distribution so even though they they are just uh, you know different distributions as long as they are normally distributed and also their spread is kind of a, a similar each other then you can run the parametric independent samples t-test so um so that was assumptions for the independent samples t-test uh, we have um another t-test right pair sample t-test which has a slightly different um, assumptions and actually it's uh, simpler than 
the independent samples t-test. So um, like the independent samples t-test, the data uh, should be, uh, they, they should be measured at least at the interval level, right? Because again, you need to be able to calculate the mean. And for the dependent samples, and uh, the, the you know, pair samples, you only need to check the normality assumption. But in this case, it is the normality of the difference data set between the groups or conditions um, that are being compared. So in this case, it doesn't matter if this group is normally distributed or this group. Right? You, you're not checking the normality of each group if they are related. Okay. What you need to check is to is the normality of the difference between the two. Okay. So here, um, so before you check the normality, what you need to do for the pair samples is that you take the difference between the two groups and have the difference. All right. And then the difference data, that's the um, data you need to check the normality. Okay, so that is the difference between the pair sample t-test and independent sample t-test. And for dependent sample, for pair samples, um, because we only have difference data, like single data, right? So there is uh, no equality of variance check because there's uh, no other data to compare the variance with. So that is the only assumption you need to check for the uh, pair sample t-test. So now let's look at how to check the normality assumption. Um, as I said, many parametric inferential tests uh, like you know, t-test are built upon the assumption that the values of interest in the population are normally distributed. However, we uh, typically do not know the shape of the original population distribution from which our sample is drawn. So, um, what we do uh, really is to check the normality of the sample instead, um, assuming that a sample from normally distributed population will also be normally distributed. So in general, there are two ways to check the normality of data, either visually or statistically, even though Jamovi can do both, but we will only cover the statistical way to check the normality assumption because this is not the actual test anyway. And also we just need just one result to show that you did check the. So there are different um, tests you can use to check the normality. And there's a different ways to actually um, bring up these tests in Jamovi, but I recommend, so um, you, know, you only need just one of them and one of them is enough. And I recommend to use Shapiro work test. And so the statistical way to check the normality assumption is actually, uh, you know, uh, is subject to a same null hypothesis and it can testing principle because these are uh, the statistical uh, statistical tests too. So here the uh, null and the alternative hypothesis are following the null uh, in running the um, normality test is that the sample data are not statistically different from normal distribution or the sample data are more or less um, normally distributed. That is your null, right? So the alternative, then that the sample data are statistically different from normal distribution, right? So this is consistent with how you set up null and alternative hypothesis, right? So null is typically set up as there is no difference. So there's no difference between your data and normal distribution. And the alternative is that there is difference between your data and normal distribution. So in this case, you, you make the you know, same decision. Uh, the decision rule is still the same, alpha 0.05. So once you run, um, say, the shapiro work test, then it'll give you the statistics and the um, respective p-value of the shapiro work test. So you look at the p-value and compare it against alpha 0.05. And if the 
p-value from Shapiro will test is less than alpha 0.5, then you reject the null, right? What that means is that you reject the null, and that means you have strong evidence to support the alternative hypothesis, which in this case, you're in trouble. Uh, because then, you know, that is saying that the normality assumption is violated. You're saying that your data are statistically different from normal distribution, which is not what you want, right? If you want to run the parametric t test. So p-value is greater than alpha 0.5, then that is when you say the normality assumption is met because now you fail to reject the null of no difference, right? So now you can say that your data are not statistically different from normal distribution. So in other words, um, it is more or less normally distributed, right? So that's what that means. And, you know, this is how to report the um, result from the Shapiro work test. So you have to report this um, whenever you run parametric t-test or par any, any parametric test, actually, wherever you need to check the uh, normality assumption. So the uh, the SW, the Shapiro work, um, the normality test show that the data are uh, significantly or not significantly deviated from the normal distribution with P uh, uh, equals such and such. So you need to uh, report the exact P value uh, wherever possible. If it is not, then you can just say either it's uh, greater than or less than alpha 0.05. That's all you have to say. You don't even have to report the statistics of um, Shapiro Wilk test. Okay, so what do we do when the normality is normality assumption is violated? So if that happens, so what that means is that your Shapiro Wilk test result p value is less than alpha 0.5. That means the normality assumption is violated. If that happens, then you have to choose the um, non -parametric, parametric alternative to the independent samples t test, which is called Mann and Whitney test. Um, Jamovi also has um, this test um, equipped uh, under the independent sample t testing procedure. So um, it is just um, you know, a box to click to get this test result. And also, even if, so, I mean, well, you, you do not have to check the normality when you have a very, very small sample size, like, you know, four to eight, because the normality assumption check, the normality test is really um, checking the distribution of the data, right? And, but if your sample size is just, is, you know, small like this, then, I mean, you know, there is really no distribution to check. So do not even bother to check the normality when the sample size is this small and just uh, go straight to run the uh, non-parametric alternative to the independent samples t-test. Right, so for independent samples t-test, you need to check the quality of variances too. But that is an additional assumption that you need to check. Um, and this is also known as homoscedasticity or homogeneity of variance assumption. And this is only for the independent groups, um, the, the between subject data, right? Um, you don't have to check this assumption for the pair samples, right? And to check the quality of variances, um, another statistic called the Levine's statistics is used. And again, because this is a statistical test, this is a subject to same null hypothesis and contesting procedure. So, what you want to show is that um, the variances in each group should be roughly equal, statistically speaking. So the null is that the variances in each samples, sample is not statistically different or they're the same, right? They're not different. And the alternative hypo hypothesis is that the variances in each group is statistically different. So this is a consistent with how we set up null and alternative hypothesis, right? Um, but this is not um, in a serious assumption when it is violated compared to the normality assumption violation. If it is violated, then there's another parametric called 
parametric test called Welch's t-test, uh, which um, takes account into uh, the differences in variance between the two groups. So let's just look at um, how to um, run this assumption check in Jamovi. So in 2015, um, this picture of dress became viral all over the internet because people quickly realized that, you know, what they see may be totally different from what others see. So I still, you know, vividly remember the day when I first saw this picture from the Facebook feed asking the color of the dress. I was wondering, you know, what is so special about this picture? Because it is white and gold to me without a hesitation or doubt. So I was like, you know, scratching my head and then um, I started to read the replies, the responses below the picture. And there are some crazy people saying, well, I see the dress as black and blue. What? No chance. I was talking to myself. And is this some kind of an April Fool's joke? But it was still a month away. Um, I believe the picture was actually posted. Um, around like end of April, uh, end of February at the time. <clears throat> so I just couldn't really understand what's really going on. So um, I asked other members of my family. <laughs> I couldn't believe what I had to hear. So they all see the dress blue and black. And now I became the one who's gone crazy. So since then, um, it has been actually reported that about 60% of the people see the dress as blue and black, 30% as white and gold, like me, and 10% blue and brown, and about 10% of people can switch between any of the color combinations. So it is, you know, quite striking and shocking to experience how segregating our perception can be. So this phenomenon has been subject to ongoing research why people see so differently, even though there's a still no consensus or hands down explanation why this is the case. So um, in the same year, a group of researchers uh, hypothesized that you know, there may be a difference in brain activity between the people seeing different color combination uh, in parts of their brains, um, which is thought to be responsible for higher cognitive functions in color perception. So the researchers um, decided to recruit 28 subjects and compare their relative brain activities in various parts of the brain with um, functional magnetic resonance imaging from people um, you know, who perceive the dress as white and gold uh, on the right here, right? So, so they'll be just, you know, given the picture of the dress. And then this group of people, the WG group, will see the dress as white and gold. And the BB group uh, will see the dress as uh, blue and black. So this is a typical example of comparing two group situation where two groups are compared over a single shared outcome measure, okay, outcome variable, which is uh, brain activity measured by fMRI. So in this case, the people in WG group only see uh, the dress as white and gold, and the people in BB group will only see the dress as blue and black. So the groups are mutually exclusive. So the comparison of brain activities will be between subject, right? Because they are not related. So now let's play the uh, game of NHST uh, with this study. So um, we need to set up the uh, null and alternative hypothesis first, right? So so we know that the um, our outcome variable is brain activity, right? And the grouping variable. So this is um, uh, you know typical um, you know scenario where you want to use t test, right? So um, you know one we we know the outcome variable and the grouping variable, 
um, is basically the um, the color of the dress or the perception of the uh, color of the dress, right? So that is the grouping variable. Um, you know, so we we um, split the uh, the subject group based on their perception of the color of the dress. So now just let's say that X bar is representing the overall brain activity, right? So we have overall brain activity of BB group. And in setting up the null, we will assume that their overall brain activity will be same or there will be no statistical difference between these two groups right so that is how we uh, usually set up the uh, null hypothesis right you assume no difference no change uh, no relationship whatsoever so in this case we do not assume any difference between the two groups in terms of the brain the overall brain now how about the alternative hypothesis um, because we don't know which way the group will differ and it is actually safe to set it as two-tailed hypothesis instead of uh, one-tailed hypothesis, right? So you will say that overall brain activity of B, B group will just differ from the overall brain activity of the WG group. And the decision rule is um, the nominal alpha 0.05, right? So if the p-value uh, after running the t-test uh, turned out to be less than alpha 0.05, then what do we do? We reject the null of no difference, right? So that means uh, that there is a significant difference between the two groups in terms of their overall brain activity. Now, the good thing about the two-tailed test is that you can figure out the direction of the difference later on by looking at the actual um, the difference or the sign of the difference. Okay, so in a sense, you really do not have to predict uh, the direction of the difference beforehand because the t test will tell you, um, you know, where the um, where, where where the difference is basically. Right? You can see that which groups uh, mean will be um, higher or be smaller than the other. So that way you can actually figure out, you can make your uh, conclusion about the direction of uh, the result um, by just uh, looking at uh, the result, right? So um, now they have their research question set up and you know we know our decision rule. So they measured um, the subject's brain activities using fMRI as uh, shown here uh, in this picture. So this is a frontal view of fMRI, right? Okay. And the subject will just lie down like this and they're going to be just um, um, move into the bore. So this is the uh, what is called the bore of the fMRI. And you know what this uh, you know this device around the uh, the subject head is um, head coil, so that device is actually used to amplify the brain signal of the patient, and what this um, subject is holding is the um, kind of an input device, right? So here this is like a kind of a periscope, so there's a mirror um, which reflects the um, uh, whatever visual signal that is fit into this fMRI machine, there's a separate in you know, a control room um, to present some kind of experimental visual stimuli. So this subject actually can see um, those visual stimuli and um, through this mirror off of um, so that is basically the reflection off of a mirror like a periscope and so what they did is actually the you know um, send the um, this picture of uh, the dress, right? And then um, the subject is just looking at the picture and just you know thinking about the color. So just thinking about the color they see from this dress, and then in real time uh, while they're doing that, the brain activity uh, uh, brain activity of this patient is 
being recorded. And so basically you record the, the brain activity of all 28 subjects, right? Uh, regardless of the BB group or the WG. So these are the data, the overall brain activity from the BB group. So the BB column represents the brain activity of the BB group and the WG column. Um, the values represent the average overall uh, the brain activity of the WG group. And even from this raw data, uh, we can see that there's something going on between these two groups, right? So if you look at the signs of these values, you know, the BB groups, the BB groups have all negative signs except for a couple of these data. On the other hand, the WG group, these values are all positive. Uh, except for these two um, negative um, brainwave activity. So, I mean, we can, we can see that already uh, that there's something going on between these two groups, right? When they see the same dress. So let's just, uh, uh, you know, uh, move this data into Jamovi to run some exploratory data analysis and the t-test. Okay, so this is just a um, um, copy data from the slide, so straight copy and paste from the slide. And the one thing you have to um, remember is that you know when you know these two groups are independent groups, then you actually have to reorganize the data uh, so that um, Jamovi can run. The, um, the respective test, which is independent samples t test. If these two groups, um, you know, were to be the pair samples or the related samples, then you can just uh, put the data as they are right now. Um, as I said before, um, the spreadsheet, any any statistical software um, that has a spreadsheet, the each row represents uh, the individual subject, and each column represents different variable. So if you find a data on the same row, right, that means it's, it is actually coming from the same individual or related individual, right? But we know that they are not related, right? So <clears throat> when these two groups are independent groups, you have to put all the outcome measurement into a single column, right? So this is going to be the brain activity. And now you're going to have to use the other column to distinguish the group membership separately. So I'll assign just one for the BB group and two for the WG group. Okay. So this is how you, um, you know, set up the um, data for the independent samples t test. Now let's name each variable accordingly. So the outcome measurement was brain ac oops, activity. And obviously this is um, the continuous data set, right? So this is actually interval. And this is grouping variable, so I would just say group. By the way, you know, naming these variable, it is pretty much up to you, right? Uh, you just uh, name the variable that makes sense to you. You don't have to copy uh, these variables um, exactly. So, and the first group is BB and the second group is WG. So this will change the grouping variable to all the BB and WG. Um, so you could have just typed up, um, you know, from the beginning, but when you have, you know, quite lots of data, text is not really ideal. So that's why people do the, you know, what is called dummy coding, just assign an you know, arbitrary number. So because that is quick. Um, anyhow, so now we are ready to run independent samples t test. Um, in fact, before you do any inferential statistics, um, you actually have to look at the data first. So that's the exploratory data analysis, right? But um, Jamovi actually 
um, offers kind of a one-stop shopping uh, for anything. Um, so let's just uh, straight uh, run the t-test, independent samples t-test. Right, so here we have, so students t-test is default, right? So that is our default parametric t-test. So you, you use this student's t-test to compare two um, groups. So in our case, this is the independent groups, right? You use Welch's t-test when the equality of variance assumption is violated, okay? Man at Whitney U, you use this when the normality, normality assumption is violated, okay? Now, you need to check these two tests, right? Because you need to check these assumptions, two assumptions. Um, effect size is um, kind of a normalized um, power you have in the test. So let's just request this, and you can also calculate the confidence interval, 95% confidence interval on the effect size. And also, we can request the mean difference, and it's 95% confidence interval. So, mean difference between the two groups. And <clears throat> Of, of course, you need the uh, descriptives and descriptive plots. And because we are actually testing the two-tailed hypothesis, and you know, by default, it is giving you the two-tailed testing. But if you have directional hypothesis, you know, depending upon the direction of the difference you're predicting, you just choose either of these. Um, um, there is no missing value, so you just leave this, uh, um, you know, default options. And this is it, I think. So we have pretty much everything. Now, the dependent variable is the um, outcome measurement. So you move brain activity. And then <clears throat> you need to move this grouping variable. Compare these two groups. So there is um, our output of... Let me <clears throat> So before we look at the um, the independent sample t test output, let's look at the descriptive test first. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so this is the uh, group descriptive, um, the brain activity of BB group and WG group. And the number of data set in each group of 14 and 14. In case of independent samples, uh, so independent groups, these numbers uh, don't have to be the same, right? Because they are not uh, related or paired. Now, the mean brain activity for BB group is negative 0.274, whereas mean brain activity for WG group is 0 0.309. So there's uh, quite a lot of difference between the two groups. And the median mean, they are kind of a similar to the respective mean. And this is standard deviation of those means. It is not the standard deviation of the median, by the way, okay? Standard deviation is always goes with the mean statistics. I have seen some people actually report the median along with the standard deviation. That is just, just wrong. That is just flat wrong because you, you calculate the standard deviation using the sample mean, then why would you pair median with standard deviation to um, show the, the spread in the data from the median when this is actually based on the mean, right? So you always have to remember that mean goes with the standard deviation, median goes with IQR, okay? <clears throat> Now, standard error of the mean, um, so if you divide this standard deviation by square root of 14, then you will get the standard error of the mean, okay? So that's basically what it is. But with numbers, it is really um, you know hard to see what's really going on. So we have this side-by-side 95% -side confidence interval. This is a very important. So we have two different groups, BB group, WG group, and on the y-axis, we have brain activity. Now, um, this small circle in the middle of the 95% confidence interval is the respective mean. So this is the mean of the BB group. 
so it was on the negative side right so that's negative 0.274 that's where that is and the mean of the wg group is positive 0.309 which is around here right and this is kind of optional so um along with the mean they also um show the median statistics you know they are very close to each other so that means they probably you know the data the spread of the data is quite symmetric around the center and and these are just plus or minus two standard um error of the mean with the t right this is not because this is a small sample it is not set it is actually t the critical t statistics they use to generate this 95 percent confidence interval but that has to do with the degrees of freedom um, so in this case oh the, the degrees of freedom by the way well, we're going to just talk about this up in um, when, when we talk about talk about the um the t-test statistics but um here so if we look at the size of the 95 percent confidence interval and then see how much overlap there is there is no overlap right they are not overlapping each other these two 95 percent confidence in fact they are separated by this much so this indicates a huge difference statistical difference we're talking about and um so when uh, there is no overlap between the two 95 percent confidence interval in this case right so that is actually telling us even without looking at the actual statistics this mean difference, the mean difference will be statistically significant, at least at the level of uh, significance alpha 0.05. So let's just um, take a look at this in more detail. Now we're back to the slide. And this side-by-side 95% -side confidence interval is, uh, is as a very useful visualization especially when your goal is to compare between the groups right but uh, it is very useful because you can quickly figure out if the difference between the two groups uh, in terms of the mean difference uh, will be statistically significant or not without looking at the actual t statistics and p value so this is how you actually quickly figure out um, if the mean difference will be statistically significant or not. So here we have um, uh, two 95% um, confidence interval placed side by side. So the you know middle dot represents the mean um, of each group, and these um, the lines represents the side of the uh, size of the 95% confidence interval. So in this case, um, there is you know basically no mean difference because the 95% confidence interval are overlapping, complete overlap between the two and 95% confidence interval, right? So in that case, we know that there is no difference, at least no statistically significant difference between the two groups. So N, S represents non-significance, right? So we know that this um, group is not statistically different. By just looking at how much overlap there is and next one um, now these mean uh, now looks different right but uh, the question is if this if these mean uh, is uh, these means are statistically different right but if you look at the tip the top of the um, this blue one um, it actually covers the mean of the red one, right? And the, the bottom 95% uh, confidence interval actually covers the mean of the blue one. So when there's this much overlap, right? So well, one of the tip covers the mean of the other group, then you know that this difference is not statistically significant either, okay? <clears throat> it is only when there is no overlap now if you look at this see the mean difference is quite large right and also you know the the top upper limit upper limit of the red one is touching the bottom limit the the lower limit of the blue one and they are quite you know separated right so in this case we know that this mean difference 
will be statistically significant at about a p equals 0 0.01 okay and if you have ooh, more separation right so there's uh, absolutely no overlap between the two confidence intervals right so then we know that this mean difference will be statistically significant uh, at the level of less than 0 0.01 right so in these two cases we expect to see the p-value um, greater than 0 0.05 but you know when there is basically no overlap um, we know that the, the differences between the two groups will be statistically significant so as a rough guideline when there is no overlap between the two 95 percent confidence intervals then the mean difference uh, will be statistically significant um, when the level of significance alpha is the nominal 0 0.05 so th these are those cases if there is no overlap between the two um, in terms of the 95 percent confidence level but when there is an enough overlap then the mean difference will not be statistically significant at the same level of significance alpha 0 0.05 for anything in between, right? For anything in between, you need to check the actual statistics to find out if the mean difference will be statistically significant or not. So side by side, 95% confidence interval is um, kind of a convenient way to quickly, um, you know, figure out if the groups are statistically different or not. But that only uh, is applicable when the error bars are created using the 95% confidence interval. As you can see from this graph, there are three different ways to create create an error bar. So basically, what you see here is the actually the same data, you know, which has mean of six, right? But um, these error bar are created using different dispersion statistics. So this one with standard deviation. This one with the standard error of the mean, and this is a you know 95% confidence interval. So as you can see, they um, you know come with a different sizes you know depending upon uh, the kind of dispersion statistics you choose to use to create an error bar. And it is uh, you know uh, in general it is the case that the standard deviation comes with the largest error bar, and the standard error of the mean is. Um, giving you the smallest size of error bar. So, um, you know, if you, if you read these journals, you know, people actually prefers, uh, prefer to use the, um, the standard error of the mean instead of, instead of standard deviation or the confidence interval because it kind of gives you a kind of illusion that uh, of the clean data. You know what I mean? Because when you have these large vertical bars, um, especially when you have a lot of groups to compare, then that actually, you know, makes your data look kind of a dirty in a sense, right? Um, so people prefers the standard of the mean um, over other dispersion statistics. Um, it's okay as long as you um, you are explicit about you know what you use to create. Uh, the error bar but when the goal of your experiment is to compare so that the aim of the study is that is a comparison between the groups then you know uh, you have to use the 95 percent confidence interval because that facilitate the visual comparison between the means so you can only do that you know quick eyeball inference when the error bar is created using the 95% confidence interval. Okay. okay, now we're back to uh, Jamovi output. So now that you know how to read this side by side 95% confidence interval, so what would be your expectation? So, would these two means uh, will be uh, statistically different or not? They will be because there's no overlap between these two 95% confidence interval. And in fact, they are quite um, separated, right? And given the separation, 
I guarantee that this mean difference will be statistically significant, um, way less than say p 0.01, okay? Because they are just you know, separated just quite wide, right? So distance between these two 95% um, confidence interval quite large. So I can almost guarantee that the p value will be less than 0.01 at least. So let's just uh, you know confirm if this is the case by going up. Oh, <clears throat> before we go there, um, we have to check our assumptions. So the test of normality. Um, so it is kind of a, a new thing actually for me that because in most of the, um, the statistical software, when you are checking the normality for independent groups, you need to run like a two shapiro work test or other test twice, you know, one for each group. Right, but in Jamovi, um, they actually use standardized residuals. So just just by combining you know both groups, and then they um, check this normality on the standardized residuals. So how each datum are deviated from the mean of the entire data set, um, and then you know this had, this is known to be a kind of quite you kind know, of common practice. So now you only need just a single statistic single um, test of normality so there are three different varieties um, so now jamovi gives you three different um, tests of normality shapiro work kolmogorov smirnov and anderson darling test um, sometimes it is good that you have all you know, different tests of normality, but sometimes it's not really good because that just uh, confuses you more. And sometimes they will give you different results, right? Some turned out to be significant when the other is not significant. Um, if that happens, then just go with um, the non-significant result because this is not the major result, right? Uh, this is just a kind of a diagnostic test. So you just want to choose um, that satisfied the normality assumption, which is not a significant result. So this is kind of an unofficial trick, uh, you know, what to do when you have different results. Mm. So, but in this case, we don't have that problem. All three um, test results actually converges on the same conclusion. So all these p-values, right, um, are... Uh, greater than alpha 0.05, so that means we fail to reject the null of no difference. That means um, the data, the brain activity data, are more or less normally distributed. They are not different from normal distribution. So the normality assumption is met, and the second assumption is uh, the homogeneity of variance, uh, the equality of variance, and it is tested with um, Levine's test, right? So I think it was a French statistician. That's, that's why I read it, Levine's, and that's how I was taught. And the brain activity between the two groups, right, BB group and WG group, so in terms of a spread, they should be more or less equal uh, in terms of statistics. And this is actual statistics, F statistics, that's what the Levine's test is using. And the degrees of freedom is one, that's model degrees of freedom, what they call. So this is two minus one. We have two groups and minus one. That's model degrees of freedom. And the second degrees of freedom is the error degrees of freedom. And this is actually uh, the n, the total number of data set, which is 28 minus two. So that's why you got 26. And the p value is 0.628. So what that means is that this is again greater than alpha 0.05, right? So that means we fail to reject the null of no difference. That means the variances between the two groups um, are more or less the same. They are not statistically different. Um, in other words, the um, homogeneity variance assumption is met. So now both of these assumptions are met. We can read the uh, independent samples t-test results. So this is the actual um, test that we wanted to run uh, to begin with. So the student's t-test is run on this brain activity measurement, right, outcome measurement. 
and the T statistics itself is a negative 5.84. So because the BB group was the first one, right? So you know, so this difference is BB minus WG, okay, not the other way around. And the fact that we have negative T statistics is that the brain activity of the BB group is smaller than the WG group in overall sense, okay? This is very important because it is actually telling you the direction of the conclusion, direction of the actual difference. So if you get this wrong, right, then you have a completely different result. So you always have to check the sign of the statistics, okay, to make sure that, um, you know, what you are concluding is the right conclusion. Okay, this is a very, very important. So you always have to look at your data and then if the statistics is in the right direction or not. Okay, so the degrees of freedom for independent samples t-test is n1 plus n2 minus 2, right? So basically here we have a 14 plus 14, 28 minus 2, which is 26. So that's the degrees of freedom for this independent samples t-test. And the actual mean difference is a negative 5.583, right? So again, the sign is negative. So the sign of mean, the actual mean difference and the sign of t-statistics, they should be the same, okay? Because if you remember the numerator, right? That is actually the difference between the two samples. So the sign of the mean difference and the t-statistics should be the same. And the denominator is always positive. So um, that way you know that, you know, this is another way to check if your statistics is in the right direction. And this is standard error of the, this mean difference. And this is 95% confidence interval for this mean difference. So uh, the lower limit is this, upper limit is this, and somewhere in the middle, this mean difference is located, all right? And then because the, both signs are negative the, for you know, both limits, uh, that means is that the mean difference is significantly lower from the zero difference, right? Because they are both in the negative side. That means um, the mean difference is statistically significant. Uh, statically different from the zero difference. That's what that means. And the effect size uh, is represented in Cohen's D statistics, uh, which is 2.21. Um, and then the 95% uh, confidence interval for that effect size is this. And again, um, this effect size should be located uh, in the middle of this 95% confidence interval somewhere. The absolute size of Cohen's D greater than one, any 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 effect size, uh, any any Cohen's D greater than uh, you know one in in terms of absolute size. So this the, the size of the Cohen's D here is two point two one basically, right? It's in the just a negative direction. So anything greater than one is very very large. So um, the effect, so the difference between the two is indeed very, very large, okay? It is not very common. So, you know, if the effect size is 0.2, then they say this is kind of a small size, small difference, right? If it is a 0.5, then it is considered considered um, kind of medium effect size. When it is greater than 0.8, right? And they consider the effect size as quite large, and this is even larger. Uh, than the guidelines. So we have quite a significant difference between the two. Oh, and the p-value, oh, how would I? So p-value is here, see? As we predicted, uh, the p-value is less than 0 0.001. And when the p-value is less than 0 0.001, then uh, the Jamovi doesn't really give you the exact p-value uh, because uh, it is somewhat kind of a meaningless, right? Uh, because all we care uh, is typically the alpha 0.05. If it is less than alpha 0.05, then it is significant. 
and this is a quite large statistics, extreme statistics. So the likelihood that we'll see this large statistics or more extreme will be less than 0.001. So that means we reject the null of no difference, right? So because we reject the null, uh, then we can conclude that there is actually a difference in brain activity between uh, the people who see the dress as blue and black and the people who see uh, the dress as white and gold. Now we come back to the previous study with Rogeria syndrome. In fact, the main purpose of the study was not to see if the patients are normal or not on PWV measurement, but the ultimate goal of the study was to test the effectiveness of treatment with a drug to inhibit the enzyme that interferes with the mutated protein are called progerin that is responsible for the syndrome. So the 18 children in the previous example, they all received the daily dose of the drug for two years and at the end of two year treatment and their PWV was measured again. And then we have the data here in this table and the row says, um, you know, base and base is the previous PWV measured at baseline before the drug treatment. And the bottom row says drug is the PWV v data from the same patients after they're treated with the drug for two years. So this is a typical example of within subject design where the study is the effect of a drug on an outcome measure before and after the treatment with the drug. So the real deal is, you know, whether the drug makes a significant difference or a change in PWV. So let's find out by running the pair samples t-test using Jamovi. So here the mu1 represents uh, the mean PWV of the baseline and mu2 is um, the average PWV after they are treated with the drug. So the null hypothesis is that, you know, there will be no difference after the treatment. Um, the alternative hypothesis is saying that, no, there will be difference between the two averages and preferably the mu2. So the mean PWV after treatment should be lower, right, compared to the baseline. So that is the expectation. So here is our pair data. So unlike the independent samples t-test, you do not have to distinguish uh, these two conditions with dummy coding or with the, with the grouping, uh, the variable, right? The arbitrary numbers they have to sign to distinguish the, uh, the group membership, right? The, however, because this is a paired, so the data on the same row represents the data from the same individual, right? So you don't have to use the, uh, the dummy coding variable to th distinguish the condition or group in pair samples t-test. So you just uh, use different columns to enter the data from a different condition, basically. So um, <clears throat> let's just uh, run the pair samples t-test. So click on t-test and pair samples t-test. If you click that, then it'll give you the menu to do so. So we need descriptives, descriptives plot, and mean difference with 95% confidence interval, and normality. So in this case, it is the normality, between, normality of the difference between these two conditions not normality of each condition. So I think that's all we need. And our hypothesis was two-tailed, right? So we're going to just leave this as um, what it is. And I think that's it. And Wilcoxon signed rank test. So it says Wilcoxon rank, but this is Wilcoxon signed rank test. So you 
tick this box in case the normality test uh, uh, turned out to be significant. So what that means is that when normality of the different score is violated. Um, so we're going to just uh, untick it at this moment. Um, we're going to see if the normality is okay or not. If it is not, then we're going to tick this box to see uh, what the Wilcoxon sign rank test will be. So um, <clears throat> we move both variables together because they are paired. You see, um, they are paired. So um, Jamovi will subtract uh, treated from baseline. Right? And the order of uh, subtraction is important because it'll tell you if the result uh, is in the right direction in the end, right? So as I said, um, the expectation is that treated PWV should be less than the baseline, right? So if you subtract this way, baseline minus treated, then the, um, the sign of the difference should be positive, right? Because the baseline is bigger than the treated. If you flip this, flip this uh, subtraction, so treated minus baseline, then it should be become uh, it should become negative difference. Doesn't make sense. So it is very important that you check the sign of the difference or the, check the sign of the T uh, 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 T statistics, right? Because if you remember the uh, the numerator of the T statistics calculation, it is just a um, you know sample mean minus. Uh, it is just a you know, subtraction between the two sample means, right? And the sign will be the same as the actual mean difference of the T statistics, right? So if the sign is negative, then um, you know you know that you know there's something wrong, right? Because that means the baseline is smaller than the treaty. So you have to check the sign of the difference, sign of the uh, T statistics too, to make sure that the results is in the right direction. Okay, so um, before we look at the actual t test result, you always have to look at the descriptive first. So here is our descriptive table, baseline, n equals 18, and the mean is 12.44. So that's what we calculated before. And if we look at the treated, then the mean PWV is 8.53. So there is definite decrease um, in PWV from baseline to treated. But if this difference is enough to say that this difference is statistically significant, so you have to actually take account into the standard deviation of the difference score in case of pair samples T test. I mean, if the if there's a just you know too much variability in the difference, then you know it'll model uh, the difference. You know what, how much how much difference you have um, if you have large variations at the same time, then that difference will not be statistically significant. Uh, let's look at the um, the ninety five percent confidence interval. And according to this, um, this looks like. Uh, quite a significant difference because there's no overlap, right, um, between these two error bars. So the expectation is that um, this difference, this mean difference, will be statistically significant. And here, um, the y-axis label is missing. So the y-axis y in this case is a PWV with meters per second as a unit. So when you copy um the output over to your word document you make sure that you include um the missing label right and so let's look at the normality result the shapiro work test um e equals 0.184 which is greater than alpha 0.05 so that means um, the normality is more or less okay, right? So um, the difference data are not significantly different from the normal distribution. So 
uh, we can say that the different data are normally distributed. So we can uh, read this table, the pair samples T test. So um, T with the degrees of freedom of 17 equals 6.32. And looks like P value is much, much more smaller than alpha 0.05. So the difference is at least statistically significant, right? Um, so the mean difference between the two mean is just these two, right? So that is a 3.92. <clears throat> and standard error of the difference is that, and this is the 95% confidence interval around the mean difference. So the lower boundary is 2.61, upper boundary is 5.22. And this mean difference is located in the middle of this confidence interval. And as you can see, um, the signs of both boundaries are positive, meaning that it is significantly different from, significantly positive from the zero difference, which is our null. So this actually you know, goes hand in hand, right? Um, the range of confidence interval as well as the p-value, right? So they are actually complementary each other. Um, so that's how you run the pair samples t-test basically, even though there's one caveat about this side-by-side 95% -side confidence interval. Um, so basically what Jamovi is generating in terms of side-by-side 95% -side confidence interval is that they are treating each group as if they are independent groups, not the uh, pair samples. So there is actually kind of a way to adjust the size of the error bar to um, consider the, um, the design advantage of the pair samples, but we're not going to go over that in um, this module. Um, so, um, you sometimes uh, there's cases um, where you uh, wanna be um, careful when you interpret the uh, the overlap between the two error bars. Um, in case the side by side error bar is coming from the pair samples, uh, but in many cases, um, the you know statistics will tell you if the difference will be significant or not. So um, you're you have to make the decision uh, based on the final statistics and not on the side-by-side 95% -side error bar. So um, that's pretty much about uh, everything about, you know, how to compare two groups. So, um, you know, when you are comparing two groups, here is a kind of a flow chart you uh, can follow. So for any data, um, before you run any inferential testing, uh, such as t-test, you have to, the first thing you need to do is to run exploratory data analysis, right? So you look at the data by plotting box plots or error bars and calculate all the, you know, the summary descriptive statistics, okay? And then you need to um, identify if the groups um, that are being compared are independent or not, right? If they are, then you need to check the assumption uh, if the data are normally distributed. And on top of this, there's an um, um, equality of variance check, right? Uh, but the normal assumption is more, you know, more important than the equal to variance because we have Welch's t-test, another parametric test, uh, in case the equal to variance assumption is violated. So if they are normally distributed, then we can run the independent samples t-test. If they are not, then you have to choose Men and Whitney U test, right? So uh, this is in case uh, the groups are independent. But if they are not independent, so if they are related, then the respective assumption you need to check is, again, the normality of the difference data, all right? And if they are um, normally distributed, 
then you can run the dependent samples or the pair samples to test. Otherwise, you're going to have to um, run the Wilcoxon signed rank test. So this is um, basically um, how to the steps in running uh, the t-test basically.